All right, all right, all right. My favorite place to be is the baptistry. My second place, favorite place to be is right here, is being able to speak and preach to you guys. And I had an awesome introduction worked out, planned out, but I'm not going to use it. I'm going to have a little time of confession, confession time for you guys uh, before I begin, because it goes right into what we're going to be discussing uh, today. So one of the things that I had really planned, if you guys don't know, I'm fairly new, I've only been here about a year, and about six months ago, I'm just throwing this out here, around, around February I think it was, so both of my boys, I've got two older boys, one that's 11, I think he's 12 now, so one that's 12 and one that's 7, so I've got two older boys, and they both were saved this past year. They both got saved this past year, I got to baptize both of them, and after they were saved, one of the things that was in my heart, one of the things I wanted to do was I wanted to disciple them. Because here's what I always was fearful of, and I had seen this happening in so many churches, is that somebody walks down the aisle, they fill out a piece of paper, or maybe they even get dunked in the water, and we all say, yay, and then we leave them. Isn't that kind of true on most most people? So I was like, I ain't doing that with my boys, Uh uh-uh. I'm going to let them walk down the aisle, we're going to fill out a piece of paper, I'm going to dunk them, and then I'm going to disciple them. Then I'm going to meet with them. Then I'm going to talk with them. So for several weeks, every Friday night or every Friday morning, we would go out to breakfast and we would sit around and we would do a little Bible study together and we would uh, try to figure out what the Lord was teaching them and how to pray and how to read the Bible. But we did this for several, several weeks, uh, probably even several months. We did this. um, And then all of a sudden, I I think we went to Mississippi and Georgia and all this kind of stuff, and I quit doing it. Everybody say, boo, Jason. Yeah, thank you. Easy. Not that, just a short boo would have been sufficient. You didn't have to get off. So I quit doing it. And finally, the Holy Spirit spoke to me through my wife very loudly. <laughs> it's kind of cool the way God does that, isn't it? I don't know if y'all have ever experienced that before, but uh, Sarah would point out, Jason. Why aren't you meeting with the boys? And I would give some lame excuse. I mean, I don't know. It's too early. They're not awake. I don't know. They're boring. I don't know. I would always make some excuse up. So for several weeks, I didn't do it. Well, just this past week, I'm in my office. I'm working on this sermon. I'm doing this. I'm following and listening to some other sermons that other pre-preachers preach. I'm reading Twitter. I came across this tweet, and it said this, whatever. Pastors, you're good for nothing if you minister to your congregation and don't minister to your kids. Ow. Good grief. <laughs> I'm like, Dad, that was kind of harsh. And I'm like, well, I'll just block that out, delete that, <laughs> not really pay much attention to that. So I didn't pay too much attention to it. You know, have y'all ever, has the Lord ever spoke to y'all before and y'all pushed it out of your head? Anyway, I'm just wondering. Just me? Okay, cool. Uh, liars. Um, <laughs> So after I got back home, you know, I tried to forget about what I had read earlier in the afternoon. The Holy Spirit again spoke to me through my wife. Jason, I really think you need to start doing this. Because here's what had happened. You see, I also started a new discipleship group. I'm meeting with a couple college students on Monday. And um, Monday morning we go and we meet, we read the Bible together. And I just sent a, a... a text to Sarah's like, oh, it's so good to meet, hang out with these guys. They're learning about the Bible. They're hungry. It's so much fun. She's like, well, what about your boys? Golly, I just got mean people all of a sudden. I mean, so would y'all pray for me this week that people would be nicer to me? And, uh, so she just made this point, And I mean, basically, what do you got to say? You're right. You're right. So this past week, I got to do restart the discipleship process with my boys. Got to go. Max, we go out to Starbucks. Max likes Starbucks. We go to Starbucks with Max. I like going with Jack better because we get to go eat breakfast at McDonald's. That's a lot better for me. So Saturday morning, we're out eating breakfast with um, Jack, and um, we're at a McDonald's booth, and we got our Bible open. We got this little devotional book that we're open. And um, here's what, what was cool. Some lady came up to us and just said, Young man, you should really be happy and very grateful that your father's doing this. It's going to make so much impact on you for the rest of your life. I'm like, that's right. Tell her. (laughs) But the more I got to thinking about it, you know, there's so much truth to that. There's so much truth to that. I was never discipled like that. 
So it's hard for me because I have to force myself, I have to make myself do it. Because I was not brought up that way. I was never discipled by anyone. But I do know this. We are all called to be disciplers. So somebody in my past dropped the ball. Are y'all with me on this? Many people in my past dropped the ball. Not to say that they weren't good people. Not to say that they weren't wonderful youth ministers, wonderful Sunday school teachers, good deacons, great pastors, parents. They, all of that, they were good. But you know what? They dropped the ball when it came to discipling me. I was not discipled that way. I don't want to drop the ball with my kids. I don't want to drop the ball with some of you, some of you who I meet with during the week. You know why I'm doing it? Because I don't want to drop the ball. Because I'm called to do it. And by the way, I want to go ahead and throw this out here. Everybody ready for this? Open your hands. Because I'm going to put it in your hands. So are you. You're called to do it as well. Each of us are called to make disciples. We're in the series called Unstoppable. And really what Unstoppable is about, it's about unleashing the church. It's about moving the church forward. It's about obeying what Jesus said. When Jesus said, go and make disciples, he's not talking to the preachers. He's not talking to the missionaries. He's not talking to the Sunday. He's talking to all of us. So all of us have the responsibility to go and make disciples. And I love this. In fact, you've heard this. You've heard this preached before. If not, I'm fixing to unload on you right here because in the Greek, it's not even just go. It's as you are going. As you're just doing life. Because here's the, here's the kickback on this. Jason, if you only knew my life. If you only knew how busy I am. If you only know the things that are on my plate. If you only know. Guess what, guys? I do. <laughs> I, I do know it. I mean, I've seen it. I'm living it. I'm watching it. I do know. But better yet, even if I didn't, who cares? Guess who does? Jesus knows it. Jesus knows exactly what you're doing. He knows where you are. He probably has placed you there, by the way. And he says, as you are going, as you are working, as you are schooling, I don't know if that <laughs> as you're doing whatever you're doing, make disciples. Period. No excuses. No, I'm too busy. No, I don't have the time. Really, what it comes down to this is this. I'm gonna, you don't care. That, that's not too harsh for a Sunday morning, is it? I would say that to my Wednesday night people because they're tough. Sunday morning, some of you guys are kind of, I don't know, babies. Uh, get your feelings hurt a little bit. But it's the truth. Listen, the reason I believe we are not obeying Jesus' commands is simply this. You don't care. You don't care that you're not following Jesus. Here's the, you don't care that your neighbor is going to hell. You don't care that the person you work with doesn't know about Jesus. I know that sounds harsh. Yes, I do care. Well, just let me read a passage of Scripture to you. You got your Bibles? We're going to look at Paul's example, and Paul taught us, Paul showed us how to make disciples. Paul says it very clearly. In fact, Paul says, listen, this is what we're called to do, so let's do it. In the book of 1 Thessalonians, we're just walking through the book of 1 Thessalonians. We made it through chapter 1 last week. Now today, we're going to be in chapter 2. We're going to read all of chapter 2, but I'm going to focus on one verse. Woo, only one verse. Isn't that for nice? Second. Thessalonians chapter 2, and we're going to focus here on verse 8. Look with me, if you will, in your Bibles. If you don't have a Bible, check out the screen behind me, and let's look at what the Bible says and what Paul says to this church there in Thessalonica. By the way, I want to remind you of this. Paul was only there about three weeks, 
And during this three-week time period, he invested himself into this church so much so that when he left, he looked back and said, wow, you guys are doing it. You guys are killing it. In fact, people are talking about how you guys are making disciples. People are talking about it in Macedonia and Achaia. All across the country, people have noticed what you are doing and the words getting out. Remember that last week, past seven weeks? He says, people have noticed. So how did Paul do it? How did Paul invest himself in only three weeks? How did he invest himself so fully? How did he invest himself so strategically? How did he invest himself in the life of this church so that it made such a huge difference in the entire county, in the entire country surrounding it? Well, this is how Paul did it in verse 8. If you and I can capture the essence and capture the, the thought behind verse 8 right here, let me tell you, Kirksville, woohoo! it's going to be ready. We're going to reach it. By the way, I have a small goal just to reach all of Kirksville. That's where we're starting. Here's how we do it. Verse 8, Paul said, we cared so much for you. Did you see what drove Paul? Don't, do, you, do you see what drove Paul? And the reason I said you don't care is because if we did care, this is what we would do. Paul said, we cared so much for you. Listen to the depth of his caring, the depth of his passion, the depth of his love. He said, we care so much for you that we were pleased to share with you. I love that word. I'm going to talk about it. Just He says, we were pleased. It was my pleasure. I, let me tell you, one of my, I love Chick-fil-A. I mean, I don't, that's probably because it's from Georgia and everything from Georgia is good. I think not, that's probably it. But I love Chick-fil-A. But you know one thing about Chick-fil-A? Chick-fil-A has got some winter, winter chicken dinner. They have got some great, you know, you know, customer service. Isn't that right? They got some great customer service. People need to take note at Chick-fil-A how to serve their customers. And one of the things I love, you know, people, if you've never been to Chick-fil-A, check this out. Go by. Chick-fil-A, and you know what they'll always say? My pleasure. My, that's like this, I, I guess they, they learn this. They're trained this. Hey, can I get a, a, a large Diet Coke? My pleasure. Like, that's just nice. I mean, I just, that's just sweet. That's cool. Man. Us southern folks like that, that's how we talk. We like it. My pleasure. <laughs> can, I get another, can I get another napkin? It's not as sure. Get it yourself. It, nah, my pleasure. Check this out. Listen to what Paul's saying. It was our pleasure. It was our pleasure to share with you. I wonder how many of us have that kind of mentality. How many of us have the mentality of it is our pleasure to go and to serve my neighbors? It's my pleasure to share with my coworkers. It's my pleasure. You know what most of us think? Most of us think it's my dread. Isn't, kind of, isn't that kind of how most of us think? Oh, I'm dreading walking over there. I'm dreading going to have to talk to them. Oh, the preacher said I got to do it. I don't want to do it. I dread it. I love this. Paul said, you know what? It's our pleasure. We, we receive pleasure when we're obeying. We receive pleasure when we're sharing. We have pleasure when we're giving. In fact, check it out. Let me keep reading. I'm getting stuck off. Stuck. I, didn't even, I told you I was going to do all of chapter 2. We cared so much for you that we were pleased, my pleasure, to share with you. And then check this out. Not only the gospel of God. I'm going to give you the gospel. We're going to talk about the gospel. We're going to talk about the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. you got to know the gospel. It all has to center around the gospel. We're not going to go give people a cup of cold waters and not give them the gospel. you got to give people the gospel. He says, I gave you the gospel, but not just the gospel. Check out what he also says. But not only the gospel of God, but also our own lives. Now, this is huge. And by the way, I want to go ahead and say this because that's true. This is hard. Okay? It's huge, but man. This is hard. Paul said, you know what? We care for you so much. Not only are we going to give you the gospel. We care for you so much. 
We're going to give you our very own lives. In other words, you know what that means? We may be a little uncomfortable. You know what that means? Some of my preferences may not be met. You know what that means? I'm going to take a back seat so that you can take the front seat. When we talk about giving you my own lives, this is huge because we as Christians, we as Americans, we as just people in general, we love to take things for ourselves. We want to have ourselves satisfied first, and then with the leftovers, other people can be happy. The problem with that is it's not gospel, it's not biblical, it's usually just the opposite. Jesus teaches it, now Paul teaches it. We think of others first, and then we think of ourselves. That's the message in Scripture. Well, why is it then that we fuss and fight and talk and complain about everything else? Well, I don't like this, I don't like that, da-da-da-da. And we're not even worried about the people who are hearing the gospel, we're not worried about the people who need to hear the gospel, We're more worried about ourselves. Ask ourselves this. Are people hearing the gospel? If they are, praise the Lord. Are people responding to the gospel? Praise the Lord. And after you ask all of that, maybe you say no. Well, what are you doing about that? Are you presenting the gospel? Are you preaching the gospel? Are you proclaiming the gospel? Are you making disciples? Paul said, listen, I cared for you so much. I loved you so much. I was happy, I was pleased to share the gospel. But not just the gospel. Yeah, I'm going to give you the gospel, but you know what? I'm going to give you my own life. And then I love the way it ends. He says, because you've become dear to us. You've become special to us. You know why I take my boys on Friday and Saturday mornings, teach them the gospel, give them my life, speak into their lives. You know why I do this? Because they're dear to me. They're dear to me. I realize they're dear to me. I love them. I have this responsibility in front of me. They they, they mean something to me. I also realize this. If I want, who will? Right? If I want, who will? So to begin, before that's the introduction. Before I get into the three main points, which are real short, I got communion here in a minute, so I'm going to be done and I'm not going to tell you when. <laughs> before I get into main points, I want to ask you this. Parents, every parent listening to me right now, every parent, I don't care if you're a parent of a seven-week-old or if you're a parent of a 70-year-old, if that's possible whatever you're, if you're a parent here this morning everybody look at me and listen to me how are you doing discipling your children some of you can look back your kids are growing your kids are out of the house and you can even look back and say you know what I dropped that ball I failed I'm sorry pick it up start again Listen, I know people, I've talked to some, you've, got, you've even got children who are living in this general area who are not going to church, right? Beg them, plead them, get on your hands and knees and, and do whatever it takes. Because if you want, who will? We cared so much because you were dear to us. Those of you with younger kids, maybe they're in high school, maybe they're in elementary school, Got a bunch of kids downstairs right now. If your discipleship plan for your children is to bring them to church, you've got a bad discipleship plan. Now, we'll do the best we can, but we got about two hours. You have the rest of the week. Now, the problem is, this is also your discipleship plan. To come, sit, and that's about it. And if that's your discipleship plan, it stinks too. We have to do more. Do more for yourself. Do more for your kids. We are in charge. We have responsibility. We have an opportunity 
to mold the young generation to grow up, to love church, to be passionate about Jesus, and to change the world. I, I Listen, I was watching football all weekend. I love football, but I'm watching football this past weekend. I'm watching some commercial. I don't know if it's like a Microsoft commercial or something, but it's talking about kids that can change the world. And I just wanted to kick Microsoft in the teeth because here they are. They've got this commercial about kids who can grow up and be smart and change the world. Pfft, whatever. We have kids downstairs who literally can change the world. By the gospel, it's not by Microsoft. Microsoft is not changing the world, guys. Apple is not changing the world. And if they are, they're not doing it in the good way. The gospel of Christ is what changed the world. And you and I are responsible to train our children to grow them up, to mature them in the faith, so that they can change the world. It's our job. We were reading in Timothy as I was with both the boys this past Friday and Saturday, as we were reading whatever one of the lessons was Timothy, and it said, since when did Timothy start reading the Bible? And the Bible said in Timothy, it said, since childhood. Since childhood, he had been grown up. Since childhood, he had been into the scriptures. Since childhood. Listen, we can't wait till they're teenagers. And when they're teenagers, we can't wait till they're adults where they're just immature. Now, wait till they grow up. Bob, ah, you lost them. They're gone. Most likely never to return. Are we serious about this? I hope so. I look around at so many churches today, and it's full. Churches are full of, right? Churches are full of, of older people. And the younger people, where'd the younger people go? The younger people with kids, where'd they go? The kids, where are they at? You know where they are? They're all gone because they weren't discipled. So guys, that's not going to be us at First Baptist. Are you all with me? Say, yes, sir. So we're not going to be that because we're going to be about discipling. All right, let me jump on there. Three points, I'm done in a few minutes. Here's three things. This is why we don't disciple because we have, I call them blind spots, Okay. We've got these blind spots. We've got these areas in our life that we're just not looking at. The first blind spot is this. We're just disconnected. We're just disconnected. One reason you and I do not make disciples is because we're disconnected. Here's what a disconnect looks like. There's two forms of it. One, when someone believes in Christ, now they're connected with Christ, right? We found this out. You're a new creation. You now have the Holy Spirit. You're walking in God's life. You're... You, but you left the old life. You left the old life, which is good. It's not a bad thing. But the problem is when we leave the old life, we, we forget the old life. And we forget the people who are left in the old life. And a lot of times what happens is we get so, so spiritual, so over-spiritual, that we, we think everybody who's not like us is just pure evil and that, they, that we, we almost don't love them. We almost hate them. And the church all of a sudden becomes about what we don't like and what we're not for and who we are against. Isn't that what you hear a lot of times? In and, it doesn't be and it becomes a problem. And we're disconnected from society. We're disconnected from culture. And all of a sudden, you know what people look at us at like? They look at us like, hey, there's the church. They hate everything. There's the church. They, they're good. Grief, we're so disconnected. And I look at Scripture and I look at Jesus. Jesus was not disconnected. In fact, I like, Jesus was all up in the middle of it. The religious people got ticked off at Jesus. Why are you hanging out with drunkards? Why are you hanging out at the bar? Why are you walking around with prostitutes? Why are you partying with sinners? My goodness, you're hanging out with the IRS. Tax collectors. I mean, Jesus, what's gotten into your mind? And all the religious people were upset. Because they had been disconnected from society, from the people who needed it, they were walking away from those people. And Jesus said, I've come to seek and to save that which is lost. He said, the healthy, the well, they don't need a doctor. The sick do. So you know what I'm going to go? I'm going to go to the sick people. I'm going to go to the sick people. And I'm going to teach them. And I'm going to minister to them. I'm going to preach to them. Y'all have heard this. This is not me. I mean, this is old as preachers. Right? The church is a hospital for sinners. Y'all heard that? But you know what? Way better than that. 
instead of a hospital for sinners, I'd rather us be like the Coast Guard that we're just like, go out and save. So we go out because a hospital, like, you got to come to here to get fixed. No, no. Instead of coming here to get fixed, we need to go out and fix people. And the way you fix people is through the gospel. We're not doing all the theology right now. So instead of bringing people in, help, oh, come on to church, come on, hospital, come on, come on, woo, 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 ambulance, something. we're not doing any of that. Picture us as the Coast Guard. We're in the Coast Guard, we got to go out there. I like Coast Guard. Like, man, I like, they, they get out there in the rough stuff, don't they? Y'all ever seen them people in Alaska? Man, waves and cold and ice, and they jumping in all that like crazy people. But they're doing it to save people. That needs to be us. Not just sitting back, sitting still, waiting for people to come. We need to go. By the way, isn't that what we started off with? Jesus said, go make disciples. Oh, wow. Full circle. Full circle. Y'all with me? First blind spot, we're disconnected. So I want to encourage you. Here's here's, here's, Here's the solution to this is we need to get engaged within our context. Get engaged. And please hear me on this. When I mean, when I say get engaged... I don't mean, you know, to get drunk at the bar with all the other drunks. I don't mind if you hang out at the bar. I don't. As long as you're there for gospel mind, gospel mindset. I do mind if you're there getting drunk. But I don't mind you being at the bar, hanging out, telling people about Jesus, or making relationships. I mean, you ain't got to go there. Jesus said. That's weird. That, that's, that's just weird, okay? Doesn't work. Doesn't work. You know what those people call freaks? We're not going to be that, okay? Here's your Bible. You got your Bible? It's right there. Not. Right here. Right here. Man, I'm sitting down, we're chatting, we're talking, tell me about your family. Hey, tell me about your, oh, let me tell you about, man, I got some crazy kids. Four kids, what happened? Oh, man, you don't want to know. (laughs) Start having conversations. Leads into a gospel gospel presentation. It may not. It may just lead into just being friends. You're friends with somebody at the bar, shoot ya. Hey, you want to come over to the house? My wife makes a good... I don't know, chicken dish, whatever. Come over and hang out. They start hanging out. We start building relationships. You know what I'm doing? I'm investing in their life. You know what now I'm able to do since I've invested in their life? Guess what I'm able to do now? I'm able to invite them to Christ. I'm able to invite them to church. But let me tell you, the invitation doesn't happen until the investment happens. So here's my prayer for you, and you've heard me talk about this over the last year. The evangelism strategy of First Baptist Church is not for come and see. The evangelism strategy of First Baptist Church is for you to invest and invite. You invest in people's lives. That means you're sitting down with your coworkers, getting to know them, finding out their problems, finding out their struggles. Man, that's hard. Sometimes you just got to listen to stories that are boring. But you know what that means? Back to verse 8 there. I cared so much for you. I will listen to your boring story. I cared so much for you that I will listen about your kids and how wonderful you think they are. I will even let you bring your kids to my house and tear it up. You'll let my kids come to your house and tear it up. I, I, I can do very good at that. All right, let me move on. I want, that was the first blind sight, but the second one is this. We keep looking. Oh, my goodness, I'm flying through all this stuff. This is, a, this is really one that hurts my heart, but I think it's true. The second blind spot is this. A lot of times we're just only halfway in this deal. What I mean by we're only halfway in this, you know, a lot of people, a lot of people like church, but they don't want church to leave this building. So we're only halfway in. Let me explain. Many times, people, many times people give the gospel, but they don't give their life. 
That's what I mean. Did you, back to verse 8, you saw Paul said, I'm giving you the gospel, but not only the gospel, I'm giving you my life as well. He said, I'm all in. I'm giving you the gospel and my life. What a lot of people love to do is they love to do one or the other. I will go and give the gospel. So you know what we do? We say, hey, guys, let's go do evangelism. Let's go knock on doors. So we go, knock, knock, knock. Hey, let me tell you about Jesus. Knock, 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 knock. Hey, knock, knock, let me tell you about Jesus. So we're just doing the gospel, but we're never giving our life. That's why mission trips are awesome. We love mission trips. Put me on a plane. Send me across the country. I'll tell somebody about Jesus there. You know why? Because you're only halfway in. It's easy to tell people about Jesus after a plane ride. I mean, I'm just It's true, because you know why? You fix them, pack up, and leave. Head back. But here's what the gospel, here's what he said in 2 Thessalonians, or in 1 Thessalonians. He said, I gave you my God, hey, I, I gave you the gospel and I gave you my life. Did y'all see the two things there? Now, some other people like to give the life, but not the gospel. Did y'all see the reverse of that? Oh, I'll be your friend. We'll hang out, we'll party, we'll have a good time, but you know what never happens? They never give the gospel. Oh, I'm friends with my neighbors. We do stuff all the time. Oh, yeah, man, we go hunting. We go to ball games. We do that. We're good friends. You've got a lot of good friends, and you've given your life to them. Awesome. Good job. The only problem is you're only halfway in. If all you're doing is being good friends and not giving the gospel, you're only halfway in. So it has to be a two-way street. You have to give the gospel and give your life, just as Paul did in 1 Thessalonians 2.8. Are you all with me? So don't be halfway in. What's the solution? I, I, I searched hard for this one. Go all in. <laughs> That's some, some smart stuff right there, isn't it? So the, the solution is to go all in. Give your life and give the gospel. Here's the last blind spot, and we're done. Another reason we just don't do this is simply this. I touched on it at the beginning, is we don't model it. Why don't we go and make disciples? Why aren't we making disciples who make disciples? Why is this not happening? Because we're not modeling it. I, I opened up this with an admission. I opened this up with a confession telling you, listen, I dropped the ball on my own kids. I failed. And you know what I needed to do? I needed to get on my face and I needed to say, God, I'm sorry for the responsibility you gave to me that I failed you. It was only like three weeks, but three weeks is three weeks, right? I failed you, God. There have been weeks that I've not been discipling. Maybe have been more than three weeks. It's been a while since I've not been discipling. God, I'm sorry for the responsibility you gave me. Or not just that. Listen, there are other people probably that have been in my life that I've not discipled. I've not modeled. There have been people who need it. Stop right now. Take a note. Who do you have in your life right now that you're meeting on a regular basis and you're talking Scripture with them? Who is it? And for many of us, we can't came up, come up with a name right now. I'm not talking about your Sunday school class. I'm not talking about your life group. I'm talking about a person, two people, that you actually have a discipleship process, that you're actually walking through Scripture, that you're actually finding, and you're teaching them to help you grow and for them to grow in grace. Who is it? You know why we don't do it? Because we don't model it. So here's the solution. Find someone. Here's the solution. Find someone to disciple. Don't give, me, don't give me the excuse you're too busy. Here's my response to that. You're only as busy as you want to be, and you're only busy with the things you want to do. Make this something you want to do. Make this a priority. You've got to find someone, and when you find someone... You find someone to disciple. I don't know who. Parents, it's easy. Guess who to start with? Your kids. Husbands, you don't know who? Start with your wife. Well, that's awkward. Yeah, it is. Stand up, be a leader, be a man. Women, start with your husbands. Start with, help out. This is what we're called to do. We're called to make disciples. This is how multiplication takes place. This is how changed lives takes place. Let me go back to 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. 
Let's start in verse 13. So if I told you I'm going to read a little bit. I want you to listen to what happened once this took place. Verse 13 says, And this is why we constantly thank God. Because when you received the message about God that you heard from us, you welcomed it. Not as a human message, as it truly is, but the message of God. So I want you to hear this right now this morning. This that we're talking about this morning is not some junk that Jason's got out of his mind, all right? This is not just something that I came up with. This is not something that I wrote down on a paper. I want you to hear what Paul says because what Paul says, I believe, is the same thing this morning. This is not just some human idea. Wow, Jason's got a whacked up plan. This is a God's message. This is God's plan. You don't like it. It's his plan that you don't like. Thessalonians believed it, accepted it. And then look also, which also works effectively in you believers. This plan that God instu- instituted works. I love, isn't this great? I love this because here's a guarantee. It works. Find someone to disciple. Disciple them. Teach them to disciple someone else. And it works. Let's keep reading verse 14. For you, brothers, became imitators of God's churches in Christ Jesus that are in Judea. Since you've also suffered the same things from people of your own country, just as they did from the Jews. He says, listen, you've been imitators. Other churches were doing it. You followed their example. You followed their example, and all of a sudden, things changed. People took notice. A God movement happened. So here's my prayer for us tonight, or this morning. It's not to feel like I preached all day. Here's my prayer for us this afternoon. That we take God's message, that we take God's plan, and we simply obey it. We simply follow it. We simply say, realize that this really is an unstoppable church when... We follow what Jesus says. In just a moment, I'm going to have a time of invitation, a time of decision. Listen, this time of decision, it may be just a simple time of prayer. Because, listen, I needed to do this. This is a time for me. This is a time for me to get on my face when I wasn't doing my boys, whenever I wasn't discipling my kids. You know what I needed to do? God, I'm sorry. I taught my kids how to pray this week. One of the things we taught them, rejoice, request, and repent. Repent was simply this, telling God you're sorry for when you failed him. You know what I had to do this week? Repent. God, I'm sorry for where I failed you. Any of you guys need to repent today? But During the invitation, I invite you to. I invite you to come. Maybe you need to come to the altar. Get on your face before God and say, God, I'm sorry. I'm sorry that I've not obeyed you. I'm sorry that I've not followed you. God, I'm sorry you've given me responsibility and I've dropped the ball. God, I'm sorry. Whether you're a parent with a 70-year-old or a parent with a seven-week-old, maybe you just need to say, God, I'm sorry. Some of you maybe need to pray, God, seek for somebody. God, I want somebody. Give me somebody that I can pour my life into. Give me somebody I can pour my life into. Listen, here at First Baptist, we've got a lot of good things going on. Maybe you've been visiting for a while and you're saying, you know what, Jason? I'm going to get plugged in i'm going to partner with you because i believe in the direction this church is going in and we want to join forces we want to move forward together church membership is not just that you can vote church membership means that you partner with us in the vision that we're going moving forward it's saying we want to go where you're going and we want to partner with that so listen partner up join up good stuff's going good stuff's happening but most importantly check this out none of this matters If you've not done the first thing, which is to accept Jesus. Many of you, maybe this is your first time in church. You hadn't been in church in quite a while. You saw a great testimony this morning in the baptism, showing you a new life. And what that represented was someone who, just this week, had said, God, I've been working really hard trying to be good, and I realized I can't be good enough. So instead of trusting in their own goodness, they trusted Jesus. And you too can trust Jesus today. Trust Jesus to take your sins. Trust Jesus that his death on the cross can forgive all your sins. Trust Jesus that because he rose from the grave, 
He really is God and all His promises are true. And this morning, you can trust Jesus with your life to follow Him and it will change all things. I want you to bow your heads right now. Let me pray for you during this time. Father, I want to thank you right now for what about is about to take place, Lord. Those who trust you, those who believe in you, God, those who just want to follow you. Thank you for the church, God, as we're moving forward and what you're doing among us. We just give you praise and glory for that. Help us, God, to continue in following you. Not sitting back, but being active, obedient followers. Thank you, Jesus. We ask in Christ's name. Amen.